So whenever we have an object that is moving through a gas or a liquid, the object experiences a drag force. And the magnitude or the size of this drag force is dependent on the object's velocity. But this dependency changes depending on the size of the object and the density of the gas or liquid it's moving through. So for relatively large objects moving through air, for example, things like cars or baseballs or skydivers, the drag force is proportional to the square of the velocity. So as the velocity increases, the force of drag on that object will increase by the second power. But if we're dealing with smaller objects, like this bacterium here, or pollen grain or something like that, in a medium that's denser than air, for example water, and these objects are moving relatively slowly, then this drag force here is proportional to the first power of the velocity. In other words, as the velocity increases, this drag force will increase by the same amount. So for these two different scenarios here, we need to use two different equations to describe the magnitude of the drag force. So for our large objects moving through air, this drag force is equal to one half multiplied by the drag coefficient multiplied by the density of the medium that it's moving through multiplied by the surface area that is perpendicular to the direction of motion multiplied by the object's velocity squared. So we can see from this formula here that if our area increases our drag force will increase. If the density of the air increases, then our drag force increases. But also, if our drag coefficient increases, our drag force increases. And our drag coefficient is unique to every single object that moves through a fluid. And we can only determine what the drag coefficient is for an object by putting it through a wind tunnel. But with very small objects moving through a denser medium, we need to use a formula called Stokes' Law. And Stokes' Law is the drag force is equal to 6 pi multiplied by the viscosity of the fluid multiplied by the radius of the object multiplied by its velocity. So again, the more viscous the fluid is, the larger our drag force is going to be. And also, the larger our velocity and the size of our small object here, the greater our drag force will be. Now, in some circumstances, we can use these equations here to work out the terminal velocity of certain objects falling through different gases and fluids. With our bacterium here, we also need to take into account the force due to buoyancy. Because our bacteria here will have a very similar density to the water, so buoyancy becomes significant. So we cannot really, we cannot really find the terminal velocity of something like a bacterium in water just by using Stokes' law and Newton's second law, which is force is equal to mass times acceleration. But what we can do is find a good estimate for this terminal velocity for a skydiver, for example, falling through air, because the buoyancy on the skydiver will be, will be very small. And of course, if we have a particle, say like a small particle of gold, which is far denser than the surrounding water, then the buoyancy on the gold particle would be very small as well.
But also notice that with Stokes' law, we've got this viscosity variable here. So if we've got a very dense particle within a certain liquid, if we can find the terminal velocity of this particle, we can then determine the viscosity of this fluid. And I'll get to that in a minute. The first thing we're going to do is try to estimate the terminal velocity of a skydiver falling feet first towards the ground. And we're going to use this equation to do that and Newton's second law. Now, when a skydiver is falling through the air, there are two forces that are acting on the skydiver. We've got the force due to gravity, which is the skydiver's mass multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. And we've got this upward drag force, which is described by this equation here. And we're going to ignore buoyancy for now because the density of our skydiver is much greater than the surrounding air. As the skydiver is falling, his velocity is increasing. And as his velocity increases, this drag force will also increase. The force due to gravity is always going to be the same for this particular situation. So as soon as he jumps out of the aircraft, his drag force, because his velocity is low, his drag force is going to be very low. So he's going to accelerate towards the ground. Because this force due to gravity is much larger than this drag force. But as the velocity increases and the drag force increases, we'll reach a state of terminal velocity. And at terminal velocity, the drag force and the force due to gravity are equal to one another. Or in other words, the net force acting on this skydiver is equal to the drag force pointing in the upward direction minus the skydiver's weight. And that's equal to zero because at terminal velocity, the skydiver is no longer accelerating. Remember, according to Newton's second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration. And when acceleration is zero, the force is equal to zero. So what does this actually mean? What can we do with this information? Well, if our drag force is equal to our skydiver's weight, then we can simply plug in this equation here. Then this means that one half multiplied by the drag coefficient, the density of air, the surface area, and the skydiver's velocity squared is equal to the skydiver's mass. And this only occurs when the velocity, this V term here, is at terminal velocity, the maximum allowed velocity for this skydiver. So what we can do here is simply rearrange this equation to solve for the terminal velocity. And we do this by multiplying both sides by 2 here, and then dividing both sides by this term here, and square rooting it. So this is the equation that determines our terminal velocity for any large object moving through air which in this case, because the skydiver is falling feet first, then we can approximate the skydiver as a rectangular box of something like 1.75 meters tall by 0.4 meters wide and 0.2 meters in depth. And all we're interested in for this area is the area that is perpendicular to the motion, so this area down here. So let's plug in some numbers to see what this terminal velocity might be for a skydiver falling feet first. 
So we have our area down here, which is 0.4 multiplied by 0.2, which is equal to 0.08 meters squared. That's our area. Our terminal velocity is equal to the square root of 2 times the mass. Let's imagine the mass is 75 kilograms multiplied by 9.8 meters per second squared divided by the drag coefficient. Now the drag coefficient for a skydiver is about 1.0. And again, this can only be determined by using a wind tunnel and it's unique to every single object that exists. The density of air, let's say, is 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed, and our area is 0 0.08 meters squared. This gives us a terminal velocity of approximately 124 meters Per second. Now, if our skydiver was on his stomach, this surface area is going to be a lot larger, which means our terminal velocity will be smaller, which makes sense. Now, the last thing I'm going to do is use Stokes' law here to estimate the viscosity of honey. Now we can only really do this when the particle that we're using in our experiment here is a lot denser than the medium that it's falling through. And our buoyancy is always going to play a part here. But just like our skydiver example, our goal here is to work out the terminal velocity of this particle and then rearrange Stokes' law to make the viscosity the product. So in this example, we have a steel ball bearing that is five millimeters in diameter, and it takes five seconds to fall 15 centimeters from the top to the bottom of the honey jar. Now the density of this steel ball bearing, we know 7.8 times 10 to the 3 kilograms per meter cubed. And just to remind you, we're using Stokes' law here because our particle is relatively small, it's moving slowly, and it's moving through a medium that is denser than air. So terminal velocity happens pretty quickly with particles in liquid. So we can quite accurately estimate our terminal velocity here by simply measuring the velocity, the average velocity of this particle falling through the fluid here. And velocity, average velocity, is distance over time. We've got a distance of 15 centimetres, 0.15 metres, divided by 5 seconds. And this gives us a velocity of 0.03 metres per second. And again, because terminal velocity happens pretty quickly for particles in fluids, this would be a close approximation to the terminal velocity of this particle. So we've already got this variable here. Now the radius is simply half the diameter. So our radius is equal to 2.5 millimeters, which is 0.0025 meters. And while our particle is falling at terminal velocity, like our skydiver example, we've got two forces acting on this particle. We've got the force of drag, Fs, acting upward, and the force due to gravity, which is the mass of the particle, which we'll get to in a minute, multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. Now again, Buoyancy is going to play a small part here, but we're going to ignore this for now because the density 
of the steel ball bearing is larger than the density of the honey. So at the moment this viscosity is only going to be an approximation. But at terminal velocity, these forces balance. So the net force on this object is going to equal zero. Because this particle is no longer accelerating because it's reached terminal velocity. And this means that our drag, 6 pi, viscosity, radius multiplied by terminal velocity, is equal to the weight of the particle. Now we need to work out what the mass of the particle is given its density and its diameter. Now the density of an object is given by its mass divided by its volume. And the volume of a sphere is equal to 4 over 3 pi r cubed. So we have the density of steel up here. We can work out the volume of this ball bearing given its radius here. And we can rearrange this density formula, this density equation, to get our mass. And then we can plug in our mass back into this equation here. So our mass is equal to our steel's density multiplied by its volume, which is equal to 4 over 3 multiplied by the density pi r cubed. Now we want the viscosity of the honey here. So I'm going to rearrange this equation to make the viscosity the subject of the formula here. So the viscosity is equal to mg over 6 pi r multiplied by the terminal velocity. Now we've got the mass up here, so we can plug in this mass part into our variable here. And this gives us 4 over 3 pi r cubed g over pi r terminal velocity, pi r terminal velocity and the 6 as well, multiplied by 6. So all we do here is cancel out all the relevant terms, and I forgot to add the density of the steel ball bearing here. So density. And this equals, once we cancel out everything, 2 over 9, density of the steel ball bearing, multiplied by the radius of the steel ball bearing squared, the acceleration due to gravity, divided by the terminal velocity, Vt. So we've got the radius, we've got the density, we've got the terminal velocity, and we know the acceleration due to gravity. So now we can work out the viscosity of this honey. 2 over 9, multiplied by the density of the steel, which is 7.8 times 10 to the 3 kilograms per meters cubed, multiplied by the radius squared, which is 0 0.0025 meters squared, multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, all divided by the terminal velocity, which I think we got 0 0.03 meters per second. So we get a viscosity of approximately, because we've ignored buoyancy in this case, of 3.5 kilograms per meter per second.